Let's explore how we can compute the gradients of quantum circuits automatically using the parameter shift rule. So as a summary of the story so far, there's this idea of differentiable programming where we want to write code which is numerical in nature and differentiable in nature and then optimize it towards some particular goal. We can also recognize that quantum computations are differentiable. So this means that we can apply all the tools and machinery from differentiable programming or from deep learning to quantum circuits. In particular, if we can compute the gradient of a quantum circuit's output with respect to the circuit's parameters, we can then update those parameters iteratively using a gradient descent strategy and train the quantum circuit to do something interesting. So our first worry is, how do we actually compute the gradient of a quantum circuit? The interesting circuits are likely going to be very intractable, so how could we possibly compute the gradient of those circuits? So a few strategies can be proposed. One thing you could say is, let's not compute the gradient, let's just approximate it using some agnostic method like a finite difference estimator. Another thing you could do is say, let's just do everything classically. Let's write a simulator of our circuit classically and use machine learning tools that are classically available to compute the gradients automatically. Or you could say, maybe this is too much trouble. Maybe we should just avoid using gradient descent and we should try some other optimization strategy. So I would say all of these approaches have some undesirable elements. So for instance, for the finite difference method, uh, it could work, but you're then making an approximation. And there are other sources of approximation or imprecision in quantum computing that would then compound on top of that. In particular, the device noise of near-term devices could influence your approximation quality. For the second method, this is actually a strategy you can use, but it only applies to small quantum circuits. It's not going to work when the circuits are of any significant size. And the third uh, approach would be to use a different optimization strategy. And I would say we definitely could do that, but then we might be flying blind. We might have to reinvent the wheel. Whereas if we can find ways to compute gradients, we can use all the tools and machinery available from deep learning. So. In order to figure out how to actually compute the gradient of a quantum circuit, I'll take a simple motivating example. Suppose someone gives you a computing device which is able to do one thing and one thing only. And that is, if you give it the value theta, it's able to compute sine of theta. Now, that, that gives us a method for evaluating this particular function. But what if we want to evaluate its derivative? Right? As I said, this, function, this, this uh, computing device only does one thing. It evaluates that single function. The derivative of sine is cosine, and cosine is a different function from sine. However, cosine does have the interesting property that it looks like a sine, but with a phase shift. So it turns out that, uh, I'll write it here in a bit more general form, but functions like sine or cos, their derivative can always be expressed as a forward shift by pi over 2, subtracting a negative shift by pi over 2, and then dividing by 2. So this is, again, a little bit more general than just saying cosine is sine shifted by pi over 2, but this applies to more general sinusoids. So this is what we can call a parameter shift rule. You have a function, and that function admits a formula that says its derivative can be obtained by shifting that same function forward by some value s, some fixed value s, shifting in reverse by that same value s, and then multiplying by some constant c. This is not a general property of functions, but it's a property that some functions have, in particular functions with trigonometric structure. Very, very fortunately, it happens to be the case that quantum circuits admit a parameter shift rule. Now, the basic intuition behind this is that quantum circuits are performing uh, interference of vectors in complex vectors in very large dimensional spaces, and complex numbers in particular have this trigonometric structure associated to them. So that means that quantum circuits inherit a lot of this trigonometric properties, including the parameter shift rule. So in general, a quantum circuit uh, has a parameter shift rule. It means that you can shift that circuit's output forward by some value s. You shift the parameter theta by s. You shift the parameter theta by minus s, and you measure the outputs for both of those cases, then you subtract them and multiply it by some constant c. Now this looks very, very similar to another formula, which is the finite difference formula. Uh, 
and I want to point out that these are not quite the same thing. So in particular, the finite difference estimator is an approximation. It's not an exact formula. So you have a, a forward shift and a minus shift, but that shift is by a very, very small number delta theta. And the reason it should be small is because if it's larger, then you're not getting a very good approximation to that tangent curve. So you need it to be small to get a good approximation. However, when you have a small shift, there is this fundamental sin of numerical computing. You know, it's something like thou shall not divide by a small number because things can blow up. So if you do have a small number, you can end up with things blowing up unreasonably. As well on near-term devices, they're noisy. So it could be that the small shift is smaller than the influence of noise and you're not actually seeing any meaningful signal for small shifts. On the other hand, the parameter shift rule is exact. And what this means is that there's an exact number s, typically pi over two, and it's non-infinitesimal. It's not a small number. And in fact, it's specific to each gate. So it's an exact rule and it's a large shift. So just a little bit more point about the approximation uh, if you're using finite difference, there's a trade-off you have to make. You say, uh, I need to have a good approximation, so I need a small shift, but a small shift leads to a uh, small denominator, which can blow things up. So then you want to use a large shift to avoid that, but then a large shift gives a poor approximation. So finite difference is a good approximate strategy, but it introduces unavoidable uh, trade-offs and errors that you might want to avoid, because as I'll, I'll mentioned in future slides, there's other approximations and other sources of errors in, in measuring quantum circuits that we have to deal with. So we don't want to have our estimator also having some approximation error inherently. So back to the parameter shift rule, when can we use it? As I said, it's an exact rule. So what this means is it can be used both on hardware and on simulators. So anytime where you are determining the output of a quantum circuit, you can use the parameter shift rule. And this doesn't have to be a physical hardware. But it's really cool that it can be physical hardware because it allows you to just query the same device without changing the architecture at all. So in particular, the parameter shift property depends on the gates in your circuit. So each, each gate will have its own parameter shift recipe. Uh, typically, they all look the same, but some have slightly different recipes. But the important point is that the parameter shift rule does not depend on the rest of the gates in a circuit. It only depends on the very particular gate whose parameter you're differentiating. Now, not all gates admit a parameter shift recipe or they're not known for certain gates, but most of the important gates do have a parameter shift recipe. In particular, in variational quantum circuits, single qubit rotations are very important for um, to have parameters introduced into a circuit, and those all admit a parameter shift recipe. And then as well, if you don't have a parameter shift recipe, you could still use finite difference as an approximate fallback. Now, getting more into the notion of exact versus approximate, the parameter shift rule is exact in the sense that it gives you the correct gradient up to your available numerical precision. If you're running on physical hardware, then there's a few unavoidable sources of imprecision which are going to affect this. So it's still an exact formula, but the imprecision from the hardware will affect the imprecision of the estimate. So the two important sources of imprecision, obviously near-term devices are imperfect and they're going to be noisy. The other source of imprecision is that in order to compute expectation values in practice, we have to run many, many times, sample from a circuit many times, and then average. And we're not going to get perfect precision on that with a finite number of measurement samples. So there's some imprecision coming from the estimation process. But the, the nice thing about the parameter shift rule is that it's unbiased. So if you were able to run in the ideal case with an infinite number of experimental measurements, it would converge to the correct exact result. There's actually a few variants of the parameter shift rule. The one I've been going through is I would call the original. And here, again, it depends on the particular gate. But for a particular gate, there is a recipe which consists of an S value and a C value which are typically pi over two and one half, respectively. But you shift forward by s and, by, and backwards by, by s and multiply by c, but that s is fixed. 
Also turns out that there's a continuous version of this. Uh, you can treat S not as a fixed shift, but a continuous parameter. And then C is given by the formula of two times sine of S. So C is actually a function of S and you can use S as a continuous parameter. Potentially this could be useful if you are working in a, in a regime where a particular shift is not very feasible or is not giving good results. You could work with a different shift. In the case where you have gates that can't admit a parameter shift rule, what you can do is you can decompose those gates into individual gates which give the same transformation, but those individual gates either don't have any parameters associated with them or they have known parameter sh uh, shift rules. So you can always decompose gates. And there's more recently proposed a stochastic parameter shift rule which has the promise of differentiating arbitrary gates. So when we're talking about derivatives, uh, it's sometimes interesting to consider what happens with higher order derivatives as well. So the parameter shift method is pretty generic and it allows you to not only compute derivatives and gradients, but higher order derivatives as well. So sometimes for optimization, it's important to take into account the curvature of your optimization landscape. So you wanna compute things like the Hessian matrix, the geometric tensor or the natural gradient or Fisher information matrix, these kind of things. And in general, the parameter shift rule can actually be extended to arbitrary higher order derivative uh, tensors. Now, when you extend it, you end up just adding, adding more terms. So you're shifting by more and more things forward and backwards, and you're adding more terms to the sum. And it does a very similar structure. And unfortunately, it has an exponential blow up. If you go to very high derivatives, you end up scaling in an unfavorable way, and you have many, many terms to compute but fortunately, on the other hand, uh, the symmetries of quantum gates and the symmetries of quantum circuits means that a lot of these terms can be redundant. And so if you've already computed the first order values using a parameter shift rule, you can reuse those same estimates in some of the terms to compute the higher order derivatives. So this is now the missing piece. Uh, this is what allows us to apply the ideas of differentiable programming to quantum circuits. Uh, we have a tool for computing gradients. So in particular, if I have a quantum circuit and I have a single variable in it, then what I have to do is I have to estimate two expectation values. So an expectation value is kind of a bit of a hyperparameter here for you to choose how many samples you want to choose to make that estimate, how many average uh, cases you want to average. So let's say that that's a thousand, for instance then in order to compute the gradient of, a, of this circuit with respect to that parameter, I would have to compute two times 1,000 or execute the circuit two times 1,000 times. Now, if I want to compute the gradient, uh, which is a vector of partial derivatives of m parameters, then I would need two times m times number of shots, runs of the circuits. Uh, the fortunate thing about this is that it can all be done automatically by software. It's all rule-based. As I said, these recipes are fixed for each gate. And so it can done, be done automatically by software. So this allows us to put all the pieces together. We have quantum circuits, they have free parameters, and we can automatically differentiate them by using the parameter shift rule. And then that can be a primitive to using gradient descent algorithms to train those quantum circuits. So this is really exciting. We have all the pieces we need in order to train quantum circuits. And what I'd like to talk to you about next is actually how to use all these tools to build algorithms, to discover algorithms, or to tune quantum circuits towards particular purposes.